All right, we uh, are in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Uh, we did kind of a part one last time. This is how one should regard us, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I am not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. Without us you have become kings. And would that you did reign, so that we might share the rule with you. For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death because we've become a spectacle to the world, to angels and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. To the present hour, we hunger and thirst. We are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless, and we labor working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless. When persecuted, we endure. When slandered, we entreat. We have become and are still like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel. I urge you then, be imitators of me. That is why I sent you, Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ, as I teach them everywhere in every church. Some are arrogant, as though I were not coming to you. But I will come to you soon, if the Lord wills, and I will find out not to the talk of these arrogant people, but their power. For the kingdom of God does not consist in talk, but in power. What do you wish? Shall I come to you with a rod? or with love in a spirit of gentleness. Okay. Now, if you remember, what we're talking about in 1 Corinthians is the fact that there are divisions and some people are going off to certain teachers and they like these teachers more than others because these teachers are persuasive and they're, they're good speakers. Um, <clears throat> uh, maybe they're deeper in what they're saying. You know, they're more philosophical, whatever it may be. If you cannot pick it up through the language, obviously what's happening is that Paul and his ministry is being undermined by certain people at Corinth. And it's being undermined, one, by what we talked about already, by saying, well, you know, he's not a good speaker and he's not persuasive and he's, he's not as deep as maybe, you know, these other people are. Um, but another way in which he's being undermined is simply by attacking him through a worldly lens. And this is the big message. It's not going to be a really long, uh, I think, uh, teaching today. I think the, the sole point that we need to get from this text is this, that when the devil cannot refute the truth, he's going to try to cut you off from it by slandering your teachers. He's going to try to get you to think less of your teachers, to think that they are not as spiritual or they're not as well put together or whatever by using a worldly lens to judge them so that you no longer listen to those teachers and get what you need. This, I think, is probably the most prominent way that the devil attacks a ministry. It is to undermine the ministry by saying, well, I mean, that guy is kind of boring to listen to. Or, well, you know, uh, that guy is really not a good speaker. Or, you know, the things that he lists off here, it's like he, he has to tell them, look, 
the reason why uh, I'm in poverty, the reason why I'm in jail, the reason why we've got beasts chasing us and we've got government on us, and, and we basically look like refuse to the world, is because God has made us, and it's the word for theater, he's made us apostles a theater to the world. Why? Because this is what Jesus Christ was in the world. He was rejected by the world. He was not prestigious in the eyes of the world. And so we, his ministers, will not be prestigious in the eyes of the world. And what that means is, is if you're fleshly, as they are, if you're infants in the faith, if you still don't know what spirituality looks like, you're going to judge us in, worldly, uh, in a worldly sense and think the same thing as the world thinks of us. And because of that, you're not going to want to have anything to do with us. You're not going to want to be under our ministries. You're not going to want to be teachable to us. And so I want you to see that this is, I think, the primary point of attack is that Paul's not trying to defend himself just because, oh, I, you know, I've, you've damaged my pride and I need to get my pride back. He realizes by damaging him, you're damaging his ministry and you're cutting people off from the truth of God they need to hear. So now he's got to defend himself. Second Corinthians will be him saying, hey, some of you repented, but it's actually ramped up. These teachers have even like it's taken the slander up a notch to where it's like, oh yeah, well, Paul, he's sick all the time. I mean, if he's sick all the time, then God's clearly not with him. I mean, clear, I mean what, what did he do? He's probably, a, what did he do to get that sickness? He's probably a sinner. And you know, he's really a bad, he's a bad speaker. Whereas if God was really with him, man, God would be moving powerfully through his words in a poetic fashion. And it would be really deep and philosophical and it would just, you know, it just, it would really hit home. You know, it would just really stir our spirits. So God clearly is not really with him. Um, the speaking alone, think about it, from the very beginning, was Moses a great speaker? What's his number one thing when God says, hey, I want you to go to Egypt. What does he say to God? Yeah, I'm not a good speaker. That's what slow of tongue means. I'm not, I'm not good. I, I won't be able to find the words. I'm not, I'm not good at, at public speaking, God. So send someone else. And God actually becomes a little bit perturbed and says, um, who made man's mouth? I did. You're not persuading through your words. I'm talking. And if you look at the history throughout the prophets, it's not the prophets who are good speakers. It's the false prophets. I'm not saying every good speaker is a false prophet. I'm just saying that like, that seems to be a quality that they have. They're able to persuade with their words. So the, the point is essentially that if you have a fleshly mindset, you're going to look at things and pick at things from your teachers that put them in a bad light that ultimately will bring about your own spiritual demise because you won't be able to sit under those teachers now. Oh, well, I don't like the way that guy dresses. He doesn't seem like he has it all together. Oh, I don't like, you know, the way the house is. It seems like it's disorganized. Uh, well, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, I don't like the story that he told here because that's, I don't, I don't, I don't like that story or whatever it may be. Um, I actually think the reason why evangelicalism is enamored with young pastors and young preachers is because when you're young, you're good looking Usually you care more about dressing well, so you'll, you'll be dressing really well when you're younger. You'll, you'll have more I idolism uh, in terms of like, everything will be put together better. As you get older, things start to fall apart, as those of you who are older realize. <laughs> your looks start to go. Your dress, your fashion sense is just gone completely, especially Sherry. <laughs> no, I'm joking. But you, you, you get what I realize. Like, the older people aren't the it people, right? And so, in a worldly sense, if you're looking through worldly eyes, you're going to think the spiritual people are the people who have it together. The spiritual people, man, I, I want to listen. I want to know, what, what does Britney Spears think about this topic? Seriously, why in the world? Well, I know. I, that shows how old I am. Um <laughs> But that's the thing, like, why, why, why are celebrities being invited to the White House? Why does anyone care what a celebrity thinks? Who cares? These people are train wrecks spiritually. Why? Well, because, but on the outside, they have money. They have wealth. 
If you have wealth, then maybe you're blessed by God. If you have looks, you're blessed by God. If you have, if you're dressed well, if you have cars, if you have a nice house, like whatever you have, well, you're blessed by God. You have it together. And so we tend to think this way. If you have health, you're blessed by God. If you don't have health, you're not. And so we tend to, to view people in this worldly fashion. And if the devil can get a hold of you as a Christian and say, well, you don't really want to follow a guy like that, do you? I mean, it's not put together. Then you're not going to listen to the word of God coming out of his mouth. And you're going to seek out teachers that are well put together, but frankly might be more worldly because they've sought things like riches and, um, and, and to look and have a, a certain persona on the outside. And so Paul is not received by the Corinthians. We think, oh man, if the Apostle Paul were doing this Bible study right now, everybody would show up. But that's actually not true. A lot of people would not show up because Paul's being slandered and they think Paul is less spiritual. Because their idea of spirituality is being put together and Paul just goes through this list and says, yeah, I mean, we basically we're on the run. We're, we're impoverished. We have to work with our own hands. We're not in the upper class. We don't have it together. You wouldn't want to follow us if you were of the world. And yet we know for a fact the Apostle Paul is an apostle of Jesus Christ, a personal messenger sent by Jesus Christ himself with the words of Jesus Christ, more so than Apollos, who was not an apostle of Christ. I think Apollos is an apostle of some church or something, but not of Christ. He's not sent by Christ. Yet they would prefer Apollos over Paul. And so my warning to you is to be careful because you will, and probably have already, and will in the future, have the devil put stuff in your head to slander your teachers. Not because it's going to hurt your teachers. I mean, yeah, it'll probably hurt us in some way, but ultimately it's to hurt yourself. It's to hurt you. It's to damage you so that you don't hear the word of God. That you are not convicted. That you are not drawn to Christ through the scripture. Through that ministry. Um, this is why it's so important that when you hear slander about teachers, that you immediately reject it. Now, here's, here's the principle in the Old Testament. Are you to convict someone on the basis of one witness? How many do you need? Yeah, two or three witnesses to convict someone, right? How, now, you can receive an accusation. You can pursue it and investigate it. Um, but you're only to convict, make that final judgment on two or three witnesses. How many witnesses do you need to even receive an accusation against an elder in Scripture? Do you know? Two or three. To receive an accusation, not to convict, to even receive the accusation, to even start a process of pursuing it, to even investigate, you have to have two or three to receive the accusation of, okay, now I'm going to investigate because there's two or three witnesses. The reason why God does that is because the devil, he knows the devil is going to come along with every person who has an issue with the ministry and put something in their mouth to slander your elders. So that you would be constantly on a rabbit trail of pursuing this and that and, and thinking poorly. And I, I don't know about that. Maybe this is true and I don't really want to be under this guy. So that he undermines your ministry. And he undermines your development and growth as a Christian. And so my point to you is, is if you have people come to you and they're like, oh, here's, I, yeah, you know, what about this? What do you think about that? What do you think about this? You need to shut them down. Like they're not, it's not just a matter of like, oh, I'm, we're trying to protect the honor of the elders. Like, who cares? We're men. The issue is that you need to be protecting yourself, your family, you, by shutting them down. And, and, and I, I shut down people all the time. I'm like, do you have, okay, do you have proof of that? Do you have two or three witnesses? Or, you know, or the equivalent would be, obviously, if you have like proof that's undeniable or something of something. Um, but I, I don't receive accusations. I've had plenty of people bring accusations of other elders to me. It's like, I'm sorry, I need more than just your word. That's not going to fly. 
Um, so be aware of that. I think it's. I think it, it. It happens in every ministry. I think it's happened in this ministry numerous times. Um, whenever we have people like it, our our attendance diminishes, you know, uh, we'll talk about it. Sometimes we'll be like, "Are we being slandered right now? Is that why? Like, are people? You know, when we have people leave the church or whatever, it's like, why did they leave? We, as elders, sometimes we don't know because no one talked to us about anything. And later we'll find out, oh, well, they thought that, you know, this thing was true that wasn't true, or we were being slandered here. Or, or it was something worldly. It's like, well, I just don't feel like I can follow you because I don't think you have your stuff together in a worldly sense. Um, you know, and there, there's a lot you can pick from in our, our ministry. You can be like, well, this guy doesn't, he has, he's not a good speaker. Or you can pick at me because, well, he, you know, he's sick. I don't see him on Sunday morning and uh, blah, blah, blah. Or, you know, and, you know, he dresses too well for me. He just he makes me feel bad how, how well he dresses. That was a joke, obviously. I don't know. <laughs> I'm about jokes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I was ironically talking about myself. Um, but you get it. There are things that you can pick at. Uh, and people can pick at, and the devil can pick at, so you don't actually listen to the word of God through this ministry. And I got to tell you, look, we're not perfect in by any stretch of the imagination as a church. Every church has issues. We've got issues. But I do think this church is one of the best churches in Vegas. So if the devil can kind of dislodge us out of your life, and you go to something that's like, you know, inferior then yeah, I think that he's downgraded your ability to grow. Um, that's not to say we're the only church in Vegas, but I think we're one of the best churches. And so we're going to have a target on our back. I don't think you're going to... You still have this stuff at you know Canyon Ridge, but it's going to be to a much lesser degree because you've got a pastor that no one actually probably has a whole lot of uh, time with, so you don't know him personally. He's just the speaker that comes out and talks. He's well-dressed. He's rich. He's healthy. He's got everything going for him. It's like, man, that's the guy I want to follow. I want to be like that guy. And most people from the world would be like, I want to be like that guy. And what Paul's trying to say is, and he says to him, look, I sent you Timothy because I want you to be imitators of me. I want you to be like me. And what did Paul just say his life was like? Well, I'm considered refuse. I'm considered dung by the world. The world considers me as trailer trash. And I want you to be like me. Because if the world considers you great, something's wrong. If the devil doesn't have a target on your back, something's wrong. Why does the world accept you so much? He says to them, look, you've become kings already. We're all going to become kings. We're all going to rule the world with Christ. But not yet. You think you've already, already arrived. Who are you? Who gave you that ability to ascend to a throne and judge the teachers of God with these worldly lenses? No one. If you received anything, you received it from God. You didn't receive it yourself. It's not because you're smarter than anyone else. God's given that to you as a gift. And so it's really important, uh, I, again, the reason why I think this is important for us as a ministry is because I think, again, this has not only happened before and it will happen in the future, I have an inkling it's probably happening right now. Yeah, you know, it, it, it's fascinating to me. We have people that have come and gone because, well, we didn't have a youth group. Or they come and go because, well, I, I didn't like the music. It's like, okay... Do you understand what's happening here? God is meeting you at the mountain. I don't care what the music is. I mean, if it's, if it's speaking the word of God, great. I don't care if it's my particular like, style of music or not. Who cares? That's not why I'm here. I have a feeling most people are going to church, though, and thinking, like, okay, what do I like and dislike about this church? And it's like, who cares what you like and dislike? The devil's using that so that you pick at it so that you don't actually hear the word of God that's being preached. It's like, never do that. Um, and unfortunately, we just we have a lot of people that come in and out for those reasons. I don't like the way that this was said. I don't like, um, I don't like the preaching. I don't like the teaching. And they're not talking about even the content half the time. They're talking about like how entertaining or how, how easy it was to listen to. 
Again, I think that's a problem on the part of the people. If you thought it was actually God speaking to you, if you believed that, would it be hard to listen to? It's hard to listen to because you think it's just a bunch of men lecturing you on their own ideas or something. So, again, be careful. The devil is going to use this stuff as he did with the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was not immune. The apostles themselves, John 2, later on is going to be like, yeah, you know, there's elders at this particular church that they don't receive the apostles. They don't receive us. Um, so the Apostle John, the beloved apostle, the guy who is loved by Jesus is not received by some churches because he's slandered, because he's seen as less spiritual, because he's seen as less together as the guys who basically are not being persecuted, are not impoverished, uh, you know, all of that. And they probably speak really well. So be careful with that. I know I'm preaching to the choir because you guys, I think, are not in a state of spiritual infancy like a lot of people are. But you would be surprised how many people judge on this materialistic, secular, worldly um, measurement to where they can't then sit under this ministry because they have such a problem with the ministers now because they're just judging them on all these kind of uh, superficial things. Right. Pastor. Yeah. And even if it's content based, I see this when we have visitors, when it's like, oh, well, you know, he said it in this particular way. And it's like, you've sat under enough of this teaching, or you know our elders well enough to be gracious and understanding what he meant. Right. Instead of nitpicking the small little ways in which he said it. Yeah. And that happens a lot too, where it's like, well, he shouldn't have used the word you know, happy, he should have said joyful. <laughs> right. It's like taking small little nitpicky things yeah. and expanding them into some larger issue because you're just trying to find fault. Yeah. I, I, I recently wrote a post talking about there's a difference between always reforming and always nitpicking. Um, always reforming is a biblical <coughs> reformation. You go back to the Bible and you're trying to constantly understand biblical theology and ethics and what does God want to say and all that. Always nitpicking is, I don't like this because of this speculation here. I don't like this because of this philosophy I have. I, I don't like this because, well, th this to me seems more holy than that. Um, it, it's confirmation bias, right? Like you should think of your pastors, it's probably going to be a weird analogy, but, <laughs> but you should think of your pastors like, you know, like, like guys you date, right? So like, uh, uh, if you like a guy, you'll find ways to emphasize the positive. <clears throat> if you don't like a guy, or like a person in general for that matter, you'll find ways to emphasize the negative. And so it really is a confirmation bias of, I, I think what God calls people to is actually have a confirmation bias toward the positive with your elders. Because Paul later is going to say that love actually believes all things. And that is that you give the benefit of the doubt to other Christians in general. So you certainly should give the benefit of the doubt to pastors. That, that doesn't mean that they're immune from being rebuked for sin or any of that. That, that, that should be pursued, again, on the basis of two or three witnesses. But, um, but it does mean that they shouldn't be nitpicked at or uh, basically not given the benefit of the, of the doubt. Right. If you if you really feel like oh they misspoke here, just go and ask them. Give them a chance to clarify. Yeah. Instead of then going around to everyone else and saying, oh well they said this and I don't think that's right and I don't think that's biblical. You don't even really talk to them. Right. So you're not really being fair if you're not even giving that person an opportunity. Right. Yeah. There's and and ultimately it means that there's there's a lack of love for your pastors when you're to have love for all Christians. I would say, um, including your pastors, right? So again, just be careful because my concern in the end, as I said before, is not actually for us. We're, we're big boys. Uh, we can take it. We've taken a lot of it over ministry, over the time that we've been in ministry. Um, Drake's in ministry. Uh, he's been in ministry a little bit less than us, so it can affect him. And I try to give him, you know, pep talks there uh, or whatever. <clears throat> Jeff and I have been in ministry a long amount of time. We've got this 
probably the entire time <laughs> in ministry. That's not really going to be our concern. Our concern is going to be for you. Like my concern right now is that the people who probably need to hear this aren't here right now. Some of which probably because of this. That's my concern. Now that they will be, uh, I think, hamstring spiritually. Because they won't be able to hear messages that they need to actually hear. So you can see the danger. And then you can see why there's splits in the church. Why there's divisions that Paul's talking about. Because if, you're, if, if there's this minister that's being thrown under the bus, then well, I'm going to go over to this. And I'm just going to, my church is just going to be this guy. It's just going to be this guy in, in the ministry. Um, and that's why Paul says, look, it's again, like we talked about last time, it's all Christ. Uh, Christ isn't divided up. You need all of it or you're going to be lopsided. You're going to be a golem rather than a fully formed Christian like you should be through the entire ministry of the church. Notice Paul ends by saying, hey, do you want, you want me to come with a rod? I'm, I'm going to come. I'm going to look at these people who are all puffed up and arrogant talking about me as though I'm not going to come back. Do you want me to come with a rod and basically, you know, whoop you? Or do you want me to come to you, you know, in love and a spirit of patience? I'm not going to be, you know, be as violent toward you or whatever. Um, showing that he actually has authority to bring down the hammer on them, but still letting them know, but I love you and I want to be patient toward you. I don't want to bring the hammer down on you. I want to show you love and give you the benefit of the doubt that you frankly didn't give me, <laughs> is what he's really trying to say to him. And so again, I, I don't think as teachers we're going to be bitter about it. I don't think we're trying to like, you know, trying to bring a hammer down on anyone. But I do think we want people to learn that, look, this is a ploy that the devil <clears throat> is, um, uh, is uh, sending out to destroy you. Be aware of it and be careful. Any other comments, questions? You guys know of any ministries that were actually destroyed this way? You would think in a split that shows itself, right? There's those who go with this guy and those who go yeah. with this When they don't even maybe understand what the issues are and why, you, why you're splitting. Which right. If you should split, or if you should split, or yeah. shouldn't, or they just go with who they like. Yes, it's it's a big. It becomes a popularity contest. They go with who they like. Like the the split when we first came to this church, there wasn't even another minister. They just they just went with their friends. No, well, but there was one who was acting as a minister. Well, yeah, I mean, and that's who they sure, were yeah, and that's the kind of people you've got here in Corinth. You've got like people who are kind of self appointed ministers or whatever. Mm -hmm. But Paul will call them later in Second Corinthians. He calls them the super apostles, making fun of them as though there's anything above an apostle of Christ, you know. All right, let's end in a word of prayer. Man, you want to pray for us? Thank you. Thank you, Lord, Heavenly Father. Lord, we're so grateful for this opportunity tonight to, to be among you, to hear your word, Lord. Allow your word to be sunk into us, Lord, to remember this, to respect our elders, Lord, to remember that it's the words that we hear are your words, not their words, Lord. And Lord, to not nitpick at every little thing to have the courage to speak to our elders and need me. And remember that we are put in this place in this church for a reason, and it's to hear your word more truthfully. And we continue to pray for our elders, Lord, for the strength they need, the wisdom they need to continue to preach your word as you intend. And we continue to ask that you sanctify us, Lord, and strengthen us for you. We love you, thank you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, guys.